Ukraine has been trying desperately to join NATO for years, but does a recent statement by Joe Biden delay or even dash these hopes? The World Health Organization's Regional Director for Europe thinks refugees can help bridge the shortage of doctors in the region. It sounds like a noble thought, but is it really so? Argentines in the province of Hujoy are opposing the constitutional reform that was pushed through and are being attacked by security forces. What is the reason for the protests? We'll be finding the answers to all these questions in today's episode of Daily Debrief. Should Ukraine join NATO? This question was arguably one of the reasons the disastrous war began in the first place. For years, Western countries kept promising Ukraine NATO membership, and politicians in that country kept advocating it as a solution to all problems. This was despite Russian warnings that it would be a giant provocation. After the war began last year, President Vladimir Zelensky and his allies in the West kept talking about it as the need of the hour. But now President Joe Biden says that the United States won't make it easy for Ukraine to join NATO. Is this a blow to Ukraine's NATO dreams or is it just one in a seesaw of statements from desperate officials in the West? We have News Clicks Prabir Purkasa joining us in the studio. Prabir, what Joe Biden has said, is it a turnaround from what others were saying? And if so, why? Well, you know, this is a very complicated question because what has United States said in the past? about Ukraine joining NATO. Right. That's really something that we don't know. They have been speaking in many voices. What they have been saying co continuously is that they would support Ukraine to the hilt, whatever right. it takes. This is the statement. So formally, whether they become a part of NATO or not, what does the difference? If they formally are a part of NATO right now, then the NATO is supposed to come to their defense if it is attacked and it's already under attack. Therefore, does NATO formally enter the war? Now, okay. as of now, they are not formally in the war. They are supporting Ukraine, what it takes, whatever it takes, giving them arms, giving them, as you know, intelligence support. And in this case, it's really the satellite to other uh, radio intelligence, including targeting of uh, Russian arms, ammunition, and so on. So given all of that, they are in the war, but not formally in the war. But if Ukraine is a part of NATO, then the self -def the defense the provisions of the treaty, right. which is basically what NATO is, right. would then operate, which means every country has to support each other in the war. Mm -hmm. That's so right. that is the issue, okay, that this war, doesn't seem to be it's going away. And if it continues indefinitely or it's frozen as a conflict, then such a, in a frozen conflict, can a country join NATO again becomes a question. Because officially, there is no warrant, there, there is no peace agreement. Right. Then it's still a frozen conflict, like for instance, what we've discussed earlier also, South Korea, North Korea, right. where there is a ceasefire agreement, but there is no peace agreement, right. not a basically an agreement that we have come to a common understanding. That's not there. So that is the technical part of it. Other part of it is that there are various NATO partners, and particularly those in Eastern Europe. In fact, the smaller the size, the more the barking, so to say, True. you know. I, I guess it's uh, common to the canine world as well, that they have very small countries arguing that they should immediately, NATO should declare itself a party to the war and it should start fighting on, on the side of uh, Ukraine, should send its troops. And of course, they've already sent weapons and aircraft, but all of that, but also sent troops. Now, that is a line which US doesn't want to cross. Sure. Because if it does, then you really have nuclear-powered countries, those who have nuclear arms, going to war against each other. And then, of course, where does it stop? Does it stop at Britain? Does it stop at France? If France is a party to attack on Russia, mm -hmm. and uh, Ukraine already is attacking inside Russia, if NATO becomes a party to that, well, then it's a NATO attack on Russia. Then what's Russia's response going to be? So this is why... Ultimately, I think 
Joe Biden has decided that that's a line he's not going to cross because that is bringing a nuclear holocaust much closer. And I think that's why he has said, okay, in, right now there is no immediate prospect of Ukraine joining NATO. So that is, I think, the crux of it. And let's not forget, this whole issue of joining NATO came, out, uh, came about in 2008 when uh, both Georgia and Ukraine was promised to become NATO partners, members. NATO members. And uh, this, was, uh, this was at that time itself, people had said, this is a disaster because right. this will automatically bring it into collision with Russia. And that's what happened immediately in Georgia. And post-2014, this has been a war in the making because it's very clear that the Minsk Accords, the Minsk 1-2 Accords, were essentially cover up for arming Ukraine for exactly what has been happening now. And therefore, in that sense, I do think that this is not something new, but this is reiterating the status quo that NATO will do everything in its powers to help Ukraine, but formally not enter the war. Now, this does prove correct all those people who said this would happen, including yourself. You've been saying on this show in the past that this membership is not going to work out. All it serves to do is get Ukraine to fight to the last man. Well, the Ukraine is willing to fight to the last man if they get arms, if they get weapons, and if they get the money. Mm -hmm. The question is, does it have the infrastructure to continue this war indefinitely, A, and B, are the people willing to fight like this for how long? And here again, they're at the moment in conscription mode. They're cons conscripting people of what age? Even up to 40, 50. Uh, they're conscripting people of that age to go to, go to war. Let's face it. Any war does rouse nationalist you know, uh, emotions. And there's no question that Ukraine has Perhaps for the first time, minus Donbass region, it has identified itself now as different from Russia. Because otherwise, sure. let's not forget, Russian language speakers were number one in Ukraine. In fact, that's the largest, the, it was the most common language spoken, including Ukrainian leaders who proclaimed themselves as not Russian. That was the first language. That was not the ethnicity that they pro proclaimed, but sure. that was their first language. Now, ethnicity, again, it's a complex question. What is ethnicity after all? So there have been a lot of this kind of issues. But let's face it, the fracture lines are now clear. Russian Orthodox Church, Russian language speakers, Russian ethnicity. All these three are thought to be now distanced. And even those who are fluent or they really know that their first language is Russian. Even they are now going to say, no, my first language is something else. Okay, so this is the reason why they still are willing to fight for Ukraine. And as I said, any war rouses nationalist identities. And yes, Ukraine has found an identity which is not Russian through this war. So this is the reason that Putin, I don't think, wanted this war. He wanted through the Minsk agreement to have Donbass as a part of Ukraine, but agree that Ukraine accepts Russian ethnicity and Russian language, like many other European countries have, Switzerland, Belgium. They have multiple ethnicities, multiple right. languages, including Italy, for instance. So I think those things are the ones uh, which was a possible as a model. After this, no longer. So I think that's what... The question is how long the nationalism can propel uh, people to join the Ukrainian army and can they sustain this war and how long can they sustain this war? Yes, you are right as you've quoted me that the uh, United States and its NATO allies are willing to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. But that is something which is uh, at the end of the day, that is something that they will have to think about, ki how long just as NATO countries will have to think how long can they afford to put their money and their weapons in this bottomless pit, particularly when they themselves are running out of industrial capacity to manufacture right. or match Russia in terms of this kind of a land war which they've got into. Right, Prabhi, thanks very much for joining us.
Hans Klug, the WHO Regional Director for Europe, has written an article in Al Jazeera with the title Refugees Can Fix Europe's Doctor Crisis, Poland's Showing How. The article describes how health workers among Ukrainian refugees have been drafted into Poland's health workforce. Klug describes this as a model to address the shortage of health professionals in Europe. Now, on the face of it, this sounds like a win-win for everyone concerned. European countries get medical professionals and refugees are able to sustain themselves and also help their fellow refugees. However, it's not simple and to explain why, we have with us Anna Rakar of the People's Health Movement. Anna, thanks for joining us. Anna, what Hans Klug has said, is it really as simple a solution to just drop refugees into the healthcare system? Is it so easy to solve this kind of a problem? Uh, well, you know, the short answer is, of course, not. <laughs> because <Okay. laughs> uh, because uh, I think that what uh, we have to do here is actually consider the, uh, the opinion piece that Kluge uh, uh, wrote for uh, these days uh, in the context of uh, a conversation which is kind of picking up in Europe right now. Um, and it's essentially uh, European uh, governments and the European health policy officials being um, a bit more open towards what they were already doing in practice. So, you know, for for essentially for decades, we have seen in Europe that there is essentially no health workforce policy. So if you talked about planning health systems and uh, strengthening health systems, uh, health, the health workforce would uh, always come up last. So it was a very tech oriented and budget oriented discussion that we saw. And now, you know, uh, what happened was that uh, uh, Europe has an aging health workforce, which at the very beginning is not enough Ad inadequate numbers to address all the health needs uh, that um, that Europe has. Uh, and so uh, what they're doing now uh, is essentially saying what uh, they were doing <laughs> for years, and that's that the health workers uh, will be drafted from the global south. So it's not, you know, uh, in, in the article that you mentioned, it's about uh, it's about refugees uh, and mainly may I point out Ukrainian refugees. Um, so uh, who are being integrated in the Polish health system. Uh, but it's also a much wider, a much wider uh, initiative that they have, uh, which is interrelated with the activities of uh, recruiting ag agencies in the Global South uh, specifically. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, one of the parts of the world that we want to mention here is definitely Africa, because many African countries are facing severe shortages, which are made worse uh, by the activities by uh, international recruiting agencies uh, and uh, the drafting that there is in, in the global north. So um, again, to, to come back to the article, what, uh, what we are reading here is that um, it's essentially uh, an attempt to have an easy fix for something that has been growing over the years. Uh, and in a way, which is quite uh, so uh, I'm, I'm trying not to be uh, too angry here, but I think that it's actually uh, very, very problematic what we are hearing uh, from uh, European officials right now, because uh, it's completely ignoring all the responsibilities that European countries have towards Global South, towards other uh, countries that are dealing with much, much more severe shortages uh, because of what Europe has imposed on those countries to do. These include uh, financial loans, uh, these include conditionalities that they had to uh, had to honor these include austerity measures that were actually pushed forward by by the global north people who are now surprised that uh, their own health systems do not have adequate numbers of health workers so um a caveat of course here is that the who is in a particular position uh i wouldn't want to you know this to be a very anti who intervention uh but what needs to be said is that the who europe while it does have a responsibility for strengthening the health workforce and health systems in Europe. It also should not forget that uh, this strengthening must not come at the price of health in other parts of the world. And at right now, what we're seeing is that uh, apparently uh, they, they kind of lost track of that responsibility. So I hope that uh, in the near future, we're going to read something quite different from, from WHO Europe. Right. Uh, Anna, you mentioned Africa. Now you have tracked the health systems in Africa. You have seen the problems there. And then also the problems of 
people who actually go to other countries from poorer countries from Africa to work there in the uh, join the health workforce what are their experiences really like well yeah you know uh, so in the people's health dispatch uh, I think that mostly what we have written about is the experience of uh, UK recruitment practices towards uh, the English speaking countries uh, of Africa and this is something that has come up quite the uh, quite recently because the WHO, uh, of course, they published a list uh, including countries where, which are at very, very severe risk of uh, suffering the consequences of health workers uh, shortage, shortages. And then the UK announced that, OK, so we'll stop recruiting from those countries. Um, but what we see is that, you know, the, the UK tends to, to make announcements like that, but the flow doesn't stop. So it's not only about uh, them saying, oh, you're on the red list, we're not going to actively recruit. Uh, it is. It has a lot to do with uh, what uh, what the working conditions are at home. So, if uh, in Ghana, for example, we have uh, horrible working conditions in the health system, uh, the health workers are essentially pushed to migrate uh, to other countries. So, it's not only about uh, you know European countries and the glo other global North countries saying, oh, but and wash their face and say, oh, wash their hands and say, but okay, we we won't take an active approach to that, uh, but at the same time, not do anything to actually make things better, uh, and at the same time, of course, <laughs> to think about policies that would allow them to train their own health workforce. So these are countries that have the money to actually do that. They can train, they can recruit, they can make sure that public health systems have normal working conditions where people want to stay, unlike the UK today. So, you know, that's that's one of the problems. The other problem is, of course, racism, which has to be talked about because it's not like people from, from other regions come to Europe and then they're just uh, seamlessly integrated in the health systems and they have a great time. It has a lot to do with language. It has a lot to do with the color of, of your skin. So people who have come not only to the UK, but for example, to Germany, they have reported that they felt, felt awful when, uh, when they came to work there, not only because they were discriminated against in the way that they were not given a position that fits what they were trained for. They, the migrant health workers are usually employed at lower, lower uh, staff levels. Right. Uh, but also, you know, by, by the way that they are treated, by the way that they are expected to act inside the health system, it's a very problematic issue. And this is something that has to be addressed by uh, by the WHO, I would say, at the regional and global level, and also by, by the local governments. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for that update. And uh, we'll definitely be following the story to see what comes next from the WHO. In Argentina's Jujuy province, people have taken to the streets against the constitutional reform proposed by the government of Gerardo Morales. Security forces attacked protesters and dozens were injured by tear gas, rubber bullets and batons. A young protester lost an eye after being shot in the eye with a rubber bullet. To understand why the protesters are on the streets and what the proposed constitutional reform is, we have Zoe Alexandra of People's Dispatch joining us. Zoe, scenes of repression in Hohoi, could you elaborate on why people are taking to the streets? Well, as you said, for the past several days in the Argentine province of Hohoi, um, diverse indigenous communities, trade unions, and social organizations have been on the streets mobilizing against uh, the reforms to the provincial constitution that were brought forward by the conservative governor, Gerardo Morales. Um, and these reforms have really sparked very, very strong opposition across, across many social sectors, um, precisely because they undermine uh, the rights of the people. And so, uh, for example, indigenous organizations are very concerned about this reform and what it does with regards to access to land. Um, Hujuy, to give some context, Hujuy is a, is a province um, that has some of the largest lithium deposits and the indigenous communities in the province have been engaged in several different conflicts with the multinational corporations that have been trying to develop projects there. Um, and essentially this constitutional reform says that anyone who has a property title uh, is entitled to make use of the land as it wants in favor of who owns the property 
and that those who try to alter this property relationship, uh, essentially, they don't have the right to do this. And um, it also paves the way for evictions of people who don't hold the property titles. And so why is this important in Huhui? As I said, uh, there's many different uh, conflicts over lithium mining in the province, and 90% of indigenous communities in Huhui uh, do not have land titles. Um, despite being the ancestral inhabitants of this land, of course, through the process of genocide, through colonization uh, of Argentina, where many indigenous communities were pushed back, where their lands were stolen from them, uh, many of these communities remain on the land through only through a process of intense, intense struggle against um, private corporations, against private landowners, etc. And so uh, essentially they see this constitutional reform as a threat um, to their permanence in this land and a, a really an empowerment of these private landowners to uh, essentially get rid of them, uh, gives them more impetus, more uh, legal grounds to kick them off the land. So this is one thing that has really, really concerned people and given more uh, momentum behind this movement against uh, these multinational projects, uh, extractive industry projects that have been popping up in Huhui. Um, another very concerning uh, reform that people have been pointing to is the prohibition of street blockades and highway blockades. Um, in Argentina, this is one of the most common forms of protest for the past several decades. This has been the main way that people take their demands to the street, um, and this constitutional reform essentially bans it, um, and it says that anyone who disturbs the peace is going against the law. This has been, again, widely rejected uh, by indigenous organizations, by human rights organizations, both in Argentina and internationally, as it undermines people's right to protest and their full guarantee of human rights. Uh, there have been many different papers that have come out from organizations in the country saying that this is a direct violation to actually the national constitution in Argentina. So for many, all of these factors and more, this has really brought people out onto the streets. Uh, and finally, of course, in addition to the fact that these reforms uh, undermine their rights, people are also incredibly angry over the fact that this that these constitutional reforms were essentially presented uh, one day and Oh, oh, just over a week later, they were being approved by the Constitutional Convention in the province. Um, this is a process that has that has a time allotment of about 90 days. And so people had been gearing up to stage mobilizations, thinking that there would be a process of dialogue. But uh, the governor essentially fast-tracked these reforms, clearly sensing that there would be very strong opposition on the streets uh, in Congress. And uh, just uh, was able to uh, push these forward in sort of an advanced and express way. And that has really angered people as well because it did not respect the established um, times that these usually take place. Um, in many cases, when there are reforms to constitution or there's a rewriting of the constitution, this involves a consultation process with the people of the land. And so for all these reasons, this has really um, angered people. And how has the government of Geraldo Morales responded to these widespread protests? So after these very, very unpopular reforms were approved late on Thursday night, early Thursday morning, uh, essentially hours later, uh, road blockades popped up. Protests um, continued because they had already started once the reforms were announced, they continued. Uh, and there was sort of a massive increase in popular mobilization. Uh, there have been dozens of highway blockades that have been erected across the province. Um, and uh, the response to these protests has been very, very heavy repression. On Saturday in Purma uh, Marca, uh, the police heavily repressed the road blockade of Highway 9. Um, some 30 people were detained. Dozens were injured. Uh, one 17-year-old boy lost his eye. Uh, today, just today, in the capital of Jujuy, in San Salvador de Jujuy, uh, there was further repression. People were mobilizing outside the legislature. And there's extremely uh, tough images to see, very, very graphic images of people being beaten, hit in the head, bleeding. Um, very, very, very concerning. And of course, this is this has been met with a very strong response from the national government. We have to remember that Jujuy, uh, the province, is being governed by the Radical Civil Union under Gerardo Morales, uh, the national government by Frente de Todos, the progressive coalition. Um, and the government has 
uh, repeatedly called on Gerardo Morales to stop the repression of the people, um, to try to engage in dialogue, to try to actually create the space for people to be able to raise their demands, raise their grievances, um, and above all, really for this violence against protesters to stop. Um, Gerardo Morales, in response to these protests, in response to calls from the national government to stop repression, has on one hand said that he will not uh, he will not go back on the reforms. On the other hand, he's now started to blame the national government um, for the protests, saying that um, Cristina Fernandez, Alberto Fernandez are financing these protests, that they're instigating violence, and that they're trying to subvert the order in Jujuy. So uh, we're getting into a situation where there's increased tensions, uh, increased violence against the people. Um, however, national government has been speaking out against these human rights violations, and in the city of Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina, there have been very large protests of uh, different social movements, left political parties, trade unions who are calling for an end to repression. Um, different human rights organizations have called on Gerardo Morales as well to suspend the reforms, to stop the repression. And so this is becoming from a provincial local conflict to now a national issue that is definitely going to continue over the next coming days. Right, Zoe, thanks very much for joining us. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We will see you again on Thursday. Until then, you can find more of our work on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel have more updates and this show, Daily Debrief. Thanks again for watching.